All right, this is the meat of the matter. I didn't want to go into so much so much detail about every single name, but I wanted to show you uh, with John Nolan, World Biblical Commentary Word Books, published in Dallas, Texan, Texas, 89. goes on, and then also on a website. I don't know if this still works. Let's see if it still works. We have a study. I've, lots of places I've gained, gleaned information. A lot of times on the internet. No, it's not there anymore. That's why I copied in whole so we can have it to read. It's an excellent work. And then Dwight, J. Dwight Pentecost also wrote certain items about genealogies. And between these and some others researched, I was able to, to uh, look at genealogical histories and they're not just clean, they're not great, uh, a perfect line of descendants, because what happens when a father dies childless? Uh, what happens? Uh, they had certain customs in various uh, countries and nations uh, throughout the ages to keep the record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Son of David, the Son of Abraham, consistent. Uh, and sometimes when there is a royalty involved, even in the in kings of England and Europe, in uh, the 11th and 12th, 13th, 14th centuries and so on, they had certain geolo genealogical rules and regulations. So if a king didn't have a child, then there would have to be a, somebody to, to uh, sit on the throne afterwards and they have certain sets of, of things, the way to do that. In any case, we can go through there name by name, go through the different uh, problems, especially investigating Matthew's genealogy. There are other genealogies as well. Uh, but these are the two that are most compared. So Matthew's genealogy from Abraham to David. And we have the, the record not only in Matthew, but in First Chronicles and elsewhere. So we can corroborate. And then when there are differences, we can look at uh, which descendant is the one that uh, had needed a descendant thereafter. We go all the way to the bottom now. And let's go to the main questions that the skeptics create, saying... If the virgin birth story is true, then why do the gene, gene, genealogies report Joseph as being the father of Jesus? And we've explained that. Actually, it's interesting, I never knew this before, that uh, in Luke it says, Jesus was the son of Heli, he could not be the son of two men by natural generation. But notice this carefully. The record does not state, oh, Joseph, Joseph. But the record does not state that Heli begot Joseph. So it is supposed that Joseph was the son by law or son-in-law of Heli. Heli is believed to have been the father of Mary. So that's how we, certain genealogical rules clear that up. And so let's move on. The Davidic genealogy goes through Nathan, not Solomon. This too is important. The Messiah must be David's son and heir. And we have the 2 Samuel 7, 12, and 13, Romans 1, 3, and Acts 2, 30, and 31. And his seed, according to the flesh, he must be a literal flesh and blood descendant, as it says. Hence Mary must be a member of David's house, as well as Joseph. And that's how it was done. We've looked already at how Joseph was with his son-in-law or son-in-law of Heli. Now, we look, the term begotten is not used in Luke's genealogy, so it is suspect of being a true genealogy. Again, somebody wants to provide a skeptic thing without doing his own homework. Guess who does the homework? The Christian makes you more confident in the Bible and sad to say the skeptic never bothers to actually prove these things out themselves hardly ever reads in detail the ref refutation that is presented. So, allowing the argument that this phrasing is used to indicate that Joseph was the son-in-law of Heli, I find it interesting that this entire passage, Guy Kramer says, this entire passage does not use the term begotten all the way back to David and beyond. That's the skeptic. Following the skeptic's line of reasoning, these men were all son-in-laws and not lost to the previous generation. 
considering that Israelites did not trace lines of descent through matriarchal lines, but through patriarchal lines, this seems to be a very tenuous linkage at best. The original Greek in Luke 3.24 reads, Being as was supposed, son of Joseph, of Heli, of Matat, notice that it does not say son of Heli. Sure, they could be sons-in-law and not sons, but you must take note that it does not say son of Heli. But if we look at the original Greek of Matthew 1, 2, we read that Abraham fathered Isaac, Isaac fathered Jacob, so here we have a definite patriarchal line. Matthew was written for the Jews, so we have the patriarchal line listed in Matthew chapter 1. Luke was written to the Greeks, a highly feminized culture in the first century, so a matriarchal line is possible. Can we confirm that Matthew was written for the Jews? Often, Matthew leaves Jewish phrases and customs unexplained, assuming that his readers are familiar with them. And where Luke would say kingdom of God, Matthew uses the phrase kingdom of heaven out of respect for Jews who never wrote out the word of God. Matthew 1, 18 to 25 even states that Joseph was not the biological father of Jesus. So the genealogy he gives prior to this is only a legal line of descent. Sons from Luke 3. Do we have proof that any of the men listed in the Luke 3, 23 to 38 are not sons, son-in-laws or sons-in-law? First, the genealogy in Matthew 1, 1 to 17 shows in the original Greek that each man is the father of the next. The genealogy in Luke just says that the man of the next of all the way to Adam of God. But both genealogies list the same 12 men from David to Abraham. Therefore, those passages in Luke 3, 20, 32 to 43 are showing the actual fathers and cannot be understood as son in, sons-in-law. Our question now shifts to the prior men in Luke 3, 23 to 31. Were they all son-in-laws or sons-in-law? As mentioned above, the split in genealogies happens with David's sons. Matthew lists the line of Solomon. Luke lists the line of Nathan. In 2 Samuel 5, 13 to 14, we read, Also, more sons and daughters were born to David. Now, these are the names of those who were born to him in Jerusalem. Shamua, Shobab, Nathan, and Solomon. So we know that Nathan was David's son. If we turn to Zechariah 12, 12 to 14, we read in, the old, in this Old Testament book, a prophecy, who will mourn for the Messiah when he is pierced? And the land shall mourn every family by itself, <clears throat> the family of the house of David by itself, and their wives by themselves, the family of the house of Nathan by itself, and their wives by themselves, the family of the house of Levi by itself, and their wives by themselves, the family of Shimei by itself, and their wives by themselves. It turns out that the pierced Messiah is not only not the only prophecy in these passages. If we go back to the genealogy in Luke 326, 329, 331, we find all four of the same names in the proper order. This doesn't mean that the names are one immediately after the other, but if we look at the first two names in Zechariah, David, and Nathan, we do find that these are the one are one after the other in Luke 3. The next name in Zechariah 12 is Levi. If we begin at David and then Nathan, we have to skip nine names until we run into Levi. If we skip ahead 17 more names from Levi, we find Semi. The Hebrew name in Zechariah 12 is Shimai. This same Hebrew name in the Greek New Testament would be translated as Semi. Depends upon the linguistic uh, root that you work on. I asked uh, James D. Pierce, a professor of Hebrew, if this was correct in his response, the Greek language has no SH sound and no letter for SH. So both the Greek Septuagint and the Greek New, New Testament transliterate Hebrew SH with S, I also asked him, can the na Hebrew name Shemai be understood as Semai? His response, if you are talking about a Greek translation, yes. So there, so nitpicking on differences depends upon which language you decide you want to use. A lot of people use the Septuagint, so you've got pronunciations and spelling from that, or the Masoretic texts, spellings transliterated into English from the Hebrew. So considering that the Israelites did not trace lines of descent through matriarchal lines, but through patriarchal lines, if we look at Zechariah 12, 12 to 14, 
we find that the author, who is an Israelite, traces this line to a patriarchal system from David to Shimei. This only leaves us with 14 generations from Joseph to Shimei, not 41 from Joseph to David, in which could have been son-in-laws in the Luke 3 genealogy. There is no other data in the Bible on these remaining 14 generations to express a dogmatic view on the issue, but the information from the prophecy of Zechariah seems to suggest that we should expect only one in the genealogy who is a son-in-law, and that is Joseph. Zechariah picked four names in correct order from the bloodline of the Messiah 500 years before Joseph, Jesus was born. Zechariah knew from other prophets, prophecies the Messiah was to come from the line of David. In 1 Chronicles 3, 1 to 9, we find that David had a, at least 15 sons. So Zechariah correctly picked Nathan as the line in which the Messiah would come. He also correctly picked the names Levi and Shemai or Semai to be part of that line in this prophecy. What are the odds? Plausibility. The skeptic has his answer. There it is. Just a little detail. Do you think he would have gone through that? If he did, he would have found out the same information. You can look at these references here and read, uh, verifying this. So Mary should be disqualified to transfer the rights of her lineage to her son, Jesus, since she is a woman. There you go, another skeptic point of view. Nitpicking. Now we got to do our homework, in which I did somewhat. Paul Phil Luna states, in the lineage loophole, Mary should be disqualified to transfer the rights of the lineage to her son except for a little-known exception to the rule. In Matthew 1, 1 to 16, and Luke 3, 23 to 38, we are presented with two genealogies of Jesus Christ. On the surface, these different listings would appear to be a contradiction in the scriptures. The genealogy found in Matthew's Gospel is the lineage of Jesus' earthly father, Joseph, while the genealogy found in Luke's Gospel is the lineage of Jesus' mother, Mary. However, many of the people that teach on the genealogies fail to realize or address a major problem associated with the genealogical listing found in Luke's Gospel, the lineage of Mary. Once you've established that the line is indeed Mary's, you must then deal with the second difficulty. The rights of the line are not passed through the mother, only the father. Even though Mary, through her lineage, was of the Davidic bloodline, she should be excluded from being able to pass those rights of the bloodline because of being a female, Deuteronomy 21.16. So it is not enough to prove that Mary was an unblemished descendant of David. She had to be a male to transfer the rights. And therefore, she would be disqualified to transfer the rights to her son Jesus, except for a little-known exception to the rule. And what is that? Numbers 26. We are introduced to Ziola Fahad. Ziola Fahad, who are, we are told, had no sons, only daughters. In Numbers 27, following the death of Zelophehad, the daughters of Zelophehad came before Moses and argued their plight. Because their father had died with no sons, all of the rights of inheritance were to be lost, and they felt this was unfair. So Moses prayed to God, and gave, God gave Moses an exception to the rule. There you go. The Lord told Moses, the inheritance can flow through a female if they fulfill two requirements. There must be no male offspring in the family, Numbers 27, 8. And if the female offspring should marry, they must marry within their own tribe, Numbers 36, 6. We just read that before. Now we come back to Mary. On the surface, she should be unable to transfer the rights to her son. But when you research, the, you find that Mary had no brothers, and Mary did indeed marry within her own tribe, to Joseph. What an awesome God we serve that set in order the requirements to allow the virgin birth to take place 1400 years in advance. Did Mary have any brothers? By Guy Kramer, after reading the detailed information above, I asked Phil if he knew of any information on Mary's brother. He cited numerous non-canonical works such as the Catholic Encyclopedia, the apocryphal book called the Proto Evangelium of James, Tradition states that Mary had no brothers. Car curious, I went through the four Gospels looking for any reference to collaborate Phil's references. In John 19, 25-27 we read, Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. 
And then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple...